Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Legal Protections to Prevent Discrimination Against Medical Cannabis Patients, brought to you by the Network for Public Health Law. I'm Charles Strong, the Senior Digital Marketing Coordinator at the Network's National Office, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. A quick note that both the presentation slides and video playback for this webinar will be available on the Network's website shortly after the conclusion of today's event. We strongly encourage attendee participation, um, so feel free to submit questions at any time during this webinar by using the Q&A tab on the right-hand side of your screen. All you need to do is click on that tab, select all panelists from the drop-down menu, and send us your question. We'll be addressing questions towards the end of today's event. Your moderator for today's webinar is Matthew Swinburne. Matthew is the Associate Director at the Network's Eastern Region Office, where he provides legal technical assistance on a variety of public health topics. His work currently focuses on cannabis policy, food safety and security, injury prevention, chronic disease, and environmental health. He'll be leading us through the re to the rest of today's webinar, so Matt, over to you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm excited about our presentation today. Uh, as Charles mentioned, I am the Associate Director of the Network's Eastern Region Office. And our office is actually housed in the University of Maryland's School of Law. And because of our location, we have a partnership with the school's Public Health Law Clinic, where we get the opportunity to work with student attorneys to develop resources and research on public health issues for the network. And I'm happy to say that this webinar is actually the culmination of the work of our two presenters who are um, students at the university's public health law clinic. Um, Alexandra LaFree and Edka Wong have done excellent work looking into this issue of discrimination um, against cannabis patients, medical cannabis patients. And while this webinar is going to be, you know, discussing some of their major findings, they've also produced an issue brief on this issue, as well as a survey of specific state laws and policies. Um, and both of these resources are now available on the network's website, and we'll share that link later on. Now, with that out of the way, I'd like to pass it over to our presenters. Hi, thank you, um, Matt, for that introduction. We're excited to be able to give this webinar and speak with you all today. Um, so without further delay, we'll get started. So currently, there are 36 states in Washington, D.C. that recognize medical cannabis as a lawful medication. That means that in those states, licensed health providers may authorize the use of medical cannabis as treatment. However, despite the fact that medical cannabis is legal in these states, not all of them protect these patients in a variety of areas. These areas include employment, education, renting a home, or dealing with custody and visitation rights of their children. These patients need protections because without them, they may be treated differently, which is inherently discriminatory. Such discrimination of medical cannabis patients can lead to negative health outcomes by either causing patients to delay seeking treatment or not seeking treatment at all. So from a public health perspective, such stigmatization can lead to a variety of issues, including economic instability and housing insecurity, to name a few. Um, for example, if a medical cannabis patient is terminated solely based on the employee's status as a cardholder, they're less likely to be able to maintain stable health insurance as most receive their health insurance through their work. Studies have also shown that those who experience unemployment or underemployment are more likely to report that their health interferes with their activities, that they experience chronic disease and depression, and that they perceive a lower positive self-concept to those who uh, compared to those who are adequately employed um, and beyond employment patients may face challenges in other areas that we will specifically address later in this presentation and as we discuss these different items you might wonder how they all fit together well all the different circumstances we will discuss um, employment school enrollment organ transplants etc all these areas have historically suffered from discriminatory practices to which individual states have approached differently 
So the purpose of discussing these express anti-discrimination provisions is to highlight how these historic inequities are being addressed. Additionally, these protections, um, not allowing these protections would simply undermine the state's decision to uh, legitimize medical cannabis. So some of you may be wondering how the Americans with Disability Act fits into all this. And the answer is that it does not. The ADA does not apply to medical cannabis patients because, the can because cannabis remains a Schedule I drug under the Controlled Substances Act, even if the cannabis is used for medical purposes. So Schedule I drugs are deemed to have a high potential for abuse and have no currently accepted medical purpose in the US, and therefore they may not be prescribed under federal law. So generally, the ADA prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in a variety of areas, including the workplace. A disability is defined as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity, but it does not include individuals, quote, engaged in the legal use of drugs, end quote. So because cannabis remains a Schedule One drug at the federal level and thereby illegal, any use of cannabis is considered an illegal use of drugs under the ADA. So in essence, there are no federal protections for disabled employees who use medical cannabis as treatment. And because there are no federal protections, state law governs and they are crucial to providing employment protections to these patients. This is an ongoing issue that many states are beginning to recognize. Um, and it's apparent, apparent given that nine states and DC have introduced bills um, this year alone to, in, uh, that, to improve upon their existing laws or to provide employment protections. So given the immense importance of protecting uh, cannabis patients in the workplace, 13 states and DC have passed explicit laws that prohibit an employer from discriminating against an employee or a prospective employee for their medical cannabis use. These laws generally protect cannabis patients against discriminatory hiring and discharging practices. But these provisions prohibit much more than that. They also generally prohibit an employer from threatening an employee with some term or condition or any penalty really, if solely based on the employee's status as a cannabis patient. So this would include wages and promotions, for example. Um, so just an example of some language that states have adopted. Delaware statute reads um, that discrimination is prohibited against a person in hiring, termination, or any term or condition of employment or otherwise penalize a person if the discrimination is based upon the employee status as a cardholder. Other states use much broader language like Illinois statute that reads, no employer may otherwise penalize a person solely for his or her status as a registered qualifying patient. And seven of these 13 states have also provided protections for cannabis patients that may test positive on a drug test. And this is crucial because it allows cannabis patients to take their medication without fear of adverse employment action. It also recognizes that a drug test alone is not indicative of impairment. In fact, there are trained drug recognition experts that follow a 12 step protocol to determine whether someone is impaired due to a substance and what that substance may be. So determining impairment is a process that requires a consideration of the totality of the circumstances and is not simply based on the results of a drug test. Under these employment protections, employers are not prohibited from adopting policies that disallow impairment at work. Employers are also not required to do anything that violates federal law or risks federal funding. And this is primarily to allow employers to comply with the Drug Free Workplace Act. This act is a federal law that applies to organizations that receive a federal contract of at least $100,000 or receive a federal grant. And it requires those organizations to establish a drug free workplace policy and awareness program. Um, they typically include distributing a formal policy statement notifying respective federal agencies of any violations of that formal policy and taking appropriate action against an employee who commits a violation. Additionally, there has been some concern regarding specific occupations where cannabis use may pose an increased risk of danger. There are federal pr provisions that include that exclude certain professions like railroad workers and commercial truckers from using medical cannabis. Given the carve out for adhering to federal law in the employment provisions, these federal laws would remain the same and are still applicable. There are also similar state provisions that would preclude cannabis use in certain activities and occupations as well. 
So for example, Nevada has adopted the regulations that apply to the commercial truckers at the federal level to taxi cab drivers in the state. Likewise, Maryland also prohibits the use of cannabis while operating a boat. However, it is important to note that regardless of what profession you're in, impairment is just simply not allowed at work and these protections do not change that fact. The risk that, that an employee shows up to work impaired is the same across all industries, whether the impairment is due to alcohol or a medication other than cannabis. But these employment protections are not about accommodating those behaviors. It's about protecting authorized medical cannabis patients to use their medication off-site during off hours. And lastly, while researching employment protections, we came across two states, Nevada and New York, that go a step further and require employers to provide reasonable accommodations for cannabis patients. Under Nevada law, employers must adopt any change in the work environment, um, in the work environment that would enable a cannabis patient to have equal employment opportunities. However, the law does not require modification to the job itself, meaning the employer doesn't have to make accommodations if those changes would prohibit the employee from doing the essence or carrying out the essence of the job. Also, the employer does not have to make accommodations that would endanger people, property, or otherwise impose an undue hardship on the employer. And under New York law, status as a medical cannabis patient is deemed a disability under state law. Therefore, the status of medical cannabis as a disability affords those patients protections under the state's civil rights law. And now I'll pass it along to Alex to discuss non-employment protections. Great, thank you, Edka, for that information on workplace protections. I'm going to discuss some other state protections afforded to medical cannabis patients related to school enrollment, home rentals, organ transplants, and child custody and visitation rights. So, First, starting with school enrollment, there are currently 10 states that prohibit schools from denying a medical cannabis patient enrollment education or otherwise penalizing such patients from seeking education. Our slideshow lists all 10 states, but just to name a few, this group includes states like Arizona, Arkansas, and Delaware. These protections are really crucial because education is integral to an individual's health and well being. Individuals with more education tend to have higher paying jobs and access to various health promoting benefits, such as health insurance, pay, um, excuse me, paid leave benefits and retirement accounts. Furthermore, families with higher incomes are more able to buy healthy foods, have more leisure time to exercise and have access to health services and transportation. Okay. Now, moving to another protection afforded by states is in the area of anatomical gifts, also known as organ transplants. So, 11 states, including California, Delaware, and Hawaii, prohibit the disqualification of a patient from organ transplants simply because of their status as a medical cannabis patient. So, traditionally, medical cannabis patients were denied, and still are in many places, the receipt of an organ transplant because of a concern that cannabis would increase the recipient's risk of transplant failure. Basically, the concern was that cannabis would make the recipient's body reject the organ, and as there are already a ton of people on organ transplant lists already, these entities would opt for safer transplant recipients. But actually, research indicates that medical cannabis does not place an organ recipient at an increased risk for rejection. Rather, recent research shows that THC, which is a common component in cannabis, is actually beneficial to recipients of organ transplants because of THC's role as an immunosuppressant. Therefore, this protection for organ transplants is really beneficial because it ensures that medical cannabis patients are given equal access to life-saving organs. Okay. In addition, 11 states prohibit landlords from refusing to lease or otherwise penalizing a tenant solely for the tenant's status as a medical cannabis patient. For example, Connecticut law provides that no landlord may refuse to rent a dwelling unit to a person or take action against a tenant solely on the basis of such person or tenant's status as a qualifying patient or as a primary caregiver for a qualifying patient. Importantly, however, landlords still have the right to ban smoking on the premises, even if the smoking is for medical purposes and even if they're in a state where medical cannabis is legal. Um, and that is allowed as long as the landlord includes such um, ban on smoking in the lease contract with the tenant. Protecting medical cannabis patients in the realm of housing is important for various reasons, including because it reduces housing instability, which is often associated with poorer health outcomes. 
Specifically, frequent moves may prevent families from building ties to neighborhoods and communities, which strongly influences an individual's health and well being. Additionally, children who frequently move are more likely to develop chronic health conditions and are less likely to maintain stable health insurance. Additionally, there are 12 states, including Pennsylvania, New Mexico, and New Jersey, that provide that a person entitled to a child custody or visitation rights cannot be denied such rights due to their use of medical cannabis unless their use of medical cannabis creates an unreasonable danger or threat of danger to their minor child. Um, these states also deny any presumption of neglect or child endangerment solely based on the parent's use of medical cannabis. And the protections for a parent's child and visitation rights are important because of the importance of the family unit. Um, families have a really critical role in the health and happiness of a child. Specifically, parental presence in a child's life plays a significant role in the child's development, including in their happiness, social and emotional development, relationships, and academic success. Therefore, ensuring custody and visitation rights for medical cannabis patients allows them to foster a relationship with their child while also meeting their own personal health needs. Okay, so now switching gears a little bit, we're gonna move to the area of workers' compensation. So the area of workers' compensation and medical cannabis is a bit all over the place, but I will just provide a brief summary of the legal landscape as it stands today. So currently, there are six states that recognize that workers' compensation must reimburse injured workers for the costs associated with medical cannabis treatment, as long as that treatment is reasonable and necessary. These six states include New Mexico, Connecticut, New Jersey, New York, California, and Minnesota. Importantly, and perhaps why this area is so confusing, is that these states have arrived at this decision to reimburse medical cannabis costs in different ways and on varying legal theories. So, for example, courts in New Mexico and New Jersey decreed that employers were required to reimburse employees for their use of medical cannabis to treat a workplace injury. But by contrast, New York and California made this decision through the opinions of their workers' compensation commissions, not their courts. Um, and Minnesota is the real outlier because they made this decision through regulate, excuse me, re regulations promulgated by the Department of Labor. Furthermore, there are two states, including Louisiana and New Hampshire, that through their courts have allowed reimbursement for medical cannabis medication, but they do not require reimbursement. Conversely, there are 12 states that explicitly state that medical cannabis is not reimbursable by workers' compensation, including Maine, Arizona, and North Dakota. So this case-by-case -case approach and the variable measures taken in other states should not be the standard because it creates confusion, leads to inequitable results, and fails to provide employees with clear guidelines as to their coverage options. Um, just to give you an example of the confusing nature of this medical cannabis workers' compensation realm, I'll just compare two states. So um, in a recent case in New Hampshire, the New Hampshire Supreme Court ruled that an insurer is not prohibited by federal law from reimbursing medical cannabis costs under the state's workers' compensation program. But if you cross the state border into Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Supreme Court ruled the exact opposite. That is, that medical cannabis expenses are not compensable by workers' compensation because of federal law. So really what you see is disparate results across states and sometimes within states, which ends up harming patients and undermining the effectiveness of state medical cannabis programs. So you might be wondering why employers and insurers are concerned about reimbursing for medical cannabis treatment. Well, a big concern is whether covering medical cannabis treatment would require insurers and employers to break federal law because medical cannabis is still a Schedule I substance under the Federal Controlled Substances Act. However, there is really no threat of federal prosecution for such reimbursement for at least three reasons. So first, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, there are six states that already require reimbursement and no federal prosecution or threats thereof have been issued against any of these states. And these states are not necessarily new in requiring reimbursement. So for example, New Mexico, which is considered the first state to allow reimbursement, has done this since 2014. So for seven years, there's been no threat um, of federal prosecution against them for doing so. So that's a pretty clear indication of where the federal government stands on this issue. Second, um, while medical cannabis is still illegal under federal law, 
the federal government has made clear that under its prosecutorial discretion, it is not prosecuting well-controlled medical cannabis programs and individuals who are in strict compliance with those programs. So just in case we're not familiar with the term prosecutorial discretion, that basically means um, a prosecutor has the power to decide whether to file charges for a crime and which charges to file. So if the federal government is saying that they are choosing not to prosecute these programs, it's pretty likely that these programs are safe. Third, and perhaps more practically, there is a federal appropriations writer that prohibits the United States Department of Justice from using any funding to prevent a state from instituting a medical cannabis program. Um, while the appropriations writer has to be renewed every year to remain effective, it has been renewed for the past seven years and through two separate administrations. So it appears quite likely that it will continue to be renewed. Um, therefore, there is no real threat um, or fear that insurers or employers will be interfered with because the federal government has implicitly acknowledged that medical cannabis may exist at the state level. So the question becomes, why do we want workers' compensation to cover medical cannabis treatment? Well, providing workers' compensation benefits to medical cannabis patients improves the health and well-being of workers. For example, a study published in the International Journal of Drug Policy found an association between a 19.5% drop in the number of workplace fatalities among workers aged 25 to 44 and the legalization of medical cannabis. This research therefore indicates that legalizing medical cannabis benefits employees and their families by reducing the total number of workers who die on the job. Furthermore, reimbursement of medical cannabis mitigates the devastating impacts of the opioid epidemic. Since the early 2000s, nearly 220,000 Americans have died as a result of opioids. In the workplace, the National Safety Council has found that 70% of employers reported their businesses were affected by opioid abuse, including by absenteeism, injuries, accidents, and fatal overdoses. Several scientific studies have found that medical cannabis is effective in treating pain symptoms and that many patients would even prefer cannabis to treat their own symptoms. In fact, medical cannabis is already frequently used to control and relieve pain symptoms outside of the workers' compensation system. Almost two thirds of patients in the United States who use medical cannabis use it as a treatment for chronic pain. Further, in Maryland's medical cannabis system, chronic pain is the most treated condition where over 63,000 patients are certified for this reason. Therefore, providing medical cannabis as an option under workers' compensation is a way to treat workplace injuries that often cause pain symptoms, which is a huge source of workers' compensation filings. In turn, this would incentivize workers to turn to medical cannabis patients excuse me, medical cannabis in the first place and curb the vicious cycle of addiction that often starts with a workplace injury. So in conclusion, medical cannabis is a valid and legitimate medical treatment in 36 states and Washington, DC. Despite this recognition, many states fail to adequately protect medical cannabis patients from discrimination in various aspects of their lives. Without anti-discrimination measures in place, states risk undermining the effectiveness of their medical cannabis programs and the overall health and well-being of their patients. Um, and now I will turn it back over to Matt for any questions we may have. Alex and Edka, thank you for the presentation of your research. That was really interesting. Um, we've had some questions submitted ahead of time when when people registered and we've been getting some questions uh, in the Q&A section. So I'll, I'll try to get to some of these um, that I think are, are pertinent to the research you've done. Now, one of the questions that's come up is you discussed that, um, you know, marijuana is a schedule one substance at the federal level. And that is kind of the source of it being illegal under federal law. Has there been any movement at the federal level to, you know, change the legal status to, to deschedule it, so to speak? Yeah, so I'm going to take this one. Um, so the answer is that yes, it is an ongoing discussion at the federal level to um, deschedule um, cannabis. Um, actually, last year, the MORE Act was introduced and it completely descheduled cannabis and it passed the House, but it ultimately failed. Um, in just this session, there was also legislation introduced that focused um, on descheduling cannabis as well. 
Um, but we don't necessarily know how or when any of these bills will come to fruition. So again, it's that's why it's really up to the states to provide these protections to medical cannabis patients. Okay, interesting, interesting <laughs> stuff. Yeah, um, this is a hot topic with a lot of, of movement at the, the state and federal level. Um, one of the other questions that I, I saw a couple times um, came across of this issue of with regards to protecting child custody and visitation rights of medical cannabis patients. You know, what if you have a parent that's smoking uh, marijuana in front of the child? You know, is you know, is this allowed? How is this dealt with within you know the system to protect these children? Sure, so I'll take that one. So nothing about these state protections allow parents to place their child in dangerous situations or to threaten their child in any way. So these protections are simply saying that you can't be denied custody and visitation rights solely on the basis of being a medical cannabis patient. Um, but as I mentioned um, in the slide on child custody, if the parent um, does threaten or you know, creates a dangerous situation for the child, that would not be protected. Okay. I think that's important to, to make that distinction that it's protecting their, their status as a patient, but not, you know, allowing them to do anything that would risk the health of, of their child. Um, I'm trying to scan through these. Um, now, the Q&A section is, is very difficult to read right now. Um, Okay, I have another question, and this this I saw in some of our um, pre webinar um, questions as well. Is you discussed um, protections regarding renting a home? You know, landlords have an interest in protecting their property. So, you know, with these protections in place, can landlords prevent uh, the smoking? of cannabis on their property since that is i think the uh, pathway that's most likely to you know present a risk to their property um i will also take this one so yes landlords can still restrict a tenant from smoking marijuana um, in their own units even if they are in a state that has legalized medical cannabis okay great um All right. All right. Some of these are going to the same thing asking some almost go to a, a question of uh, legal advice on, on scenarios, but let's see. Um, so we have questions that don't unfortunately don't pertain to the research areas we've looked at. Um, So, I can answer some of these that kind of go outside the scope of, of our research here. There's a question of whether or not medical cannabis use uh, was allowed as um, a treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, now, you know, for folks here, medical cannabis can only be recommended or certified for specific medical conditions. And the medical conditions vary from state to state. And I believe there are some states that allow medical cannabis for that purpose. But, you know, for your specific state, you're gonna to have to look and see what the allowable conditions are that a healthcare provider can certify the use of medical cannabis for. Um, Okay, we've got some more sharing of statutes and resources um, that we'll have to look through. Um, child neglect. This is, we're getting a lot of questions and it keeps bumping up the ones I'm trying to read. So I apologize for the delay. 
All right, here's another one. Um, and this I kind of falls out a lot of this kind of falls outside um, what we've looked at, but there was a question of whether what happens when a, a parent gives medical cannabis to a child who has not been prescribed or not prescribed but certified for medical cannabis use. You know, that is something that is against any state medical cannabis laws. Um, so, you know, that, that's prohibited behavior. Um, they can only, a child can only have access to this medication if they're certified for it. Oh, here is a good question. Um, did you guys notice in your research when you were looking at these protections? You know, we have what 36, 37 jurisdictions now that have medical cannabis use. Um, are states that also allow adult use more likely to provide these protections or are they less likely uh, when broader use is available? Did you guys notice any trends between those jurisdictions? Um, so I'll go ahead and take that. So I didn't, so when we were conducting this research, we were not um, focusing on legalization. Um, so I did not notice those trends because that wasn't really in our focus. However, um, certainly that's something that we can look into and follow up. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely something we can look up and provide, uh, you know, an update on that. So, we have a question about how these protections impact motor vehicle laws. So I'm guessing, you know, the, the question is, you know, if an individual is driving impaired, do any of these state protections somehow shield them from the, you know, the, the repercussions of their behavior? Um, so, no, these protections would not protect impairment um, while driving. Um, just to reiterate that a lot of these protections don't um, protect impairment at work either. Um, and also, I know in like in the state of Maryland, when impairment is evaluated, um, a DRE or a drug recognition expert is brought onto the scene to evaluate that. Um, but no, it would not protect and um, against any type of dangerous activity that could potentially um, be harmful to others. And I, I think that's, you know, all of, you know, as you talked about, you know, in, in the workplace, you know, this isn't about allowing people to be impaired and, and create danger for others. This is, you know, as you mentioned about protecting uh, the use of this medication in a way that's, you know, responsible. Um, So we, yeah, we have some great questions that I think go outside the scope of the research we've done and how I will address those. You know, we have some issues of provider liability for certifying patients uh, for medical cannabis. And those are questions that we can address offline because they'll, they'll take some research um, to actually uh, find the answers to, because it's a little outside the scope of what we looked at for today. So I'm just gonna do another scan through to see if there are any other questions that are on point. Um, we have an excellent question um, that, you know, is one we'll have to take offline. Can healthcare licensing boards restrict their licensees from being medical cannabis Patients, um, that's an excellent question. And we'll have to, I think we'll have to do a, a little uh, research into looking into something that specific um, because it, you know, it, it, it's, it's employment uh, related definitely, but um, is outside the employee employer relationship. Um, 
So, so I'm trying to get this to. All right, so I'll do one more scan through. All right, there are a lot of great questions here that just kind of fall outside the scope of what um, we looked at for this webinar. So for the folks whose questions we didn't get to during this time, um, you know, you'll probably be getting a message from me to, to help answer those questions offline. So gun laws. Okay, we have a question about gun laws, which I know you guys have, have come across in another context. Um, so what have you seen in terms of states creating explicit protections for gun owners? So that being a medical cannabis patient um, doesn't prohibit someone from owning a firearm. You know, I, I think we've, we've seen something, if you guys could explain what you've seen this session um, here in Maryland. Sure, um, I can take that one. So we've seen in Maryland at least one piece of legislation that is specifically aiming at ensuring that medical cannabis patients still have access to firearms and that they're not prohibited solely because they're cannabis patients. Um, I do not believe that that has passed yet, um, but we are still keeping track of it. Excellent, excellent. You know, and, and you have issues of you know the Second Amendment constitutional issues. So, you know, states are trying to. You know, take it out of the court's hands in terms of, you know, having to do that Second Amendment analysis uh, with this. Now, and I think we we got an, an interesting suggestion, uh, and I like it, that because there are so many questions that kind of are either tangentially related or outside the scope of, of the research that was done, you know, we'll look at doing a follow up uh, webinar once we've had a chance to um you know look at these and, and kind of address some of the additional uh questions and concerns that people have now the slides will be made available that's an easy question that i can answer no problem um but i think slides slides will definitely but um i just want to thank you know the presenters again for sharing the research that they've done into these state policies and let folks know that you know their research is available on the network's website um, so that you can look at those documents kind of the state survey of policies and the issue brief that explores those policies and for folks whose questions we weren't able to answer um, you know we're going to be doing some research and reaching out to you and also considering you know a potential follow-up uh, webinar now, Edka and Alex are graduating, so your follow-up webinar would probably be with someone like me, so I apologize for that. Um, and maybe I can rope in some other folks to help answer some of these great questions. But, you know, that's what we have for you today. And I just want to thank everybody for making time to come out and, um, you know, learn about the research we've done. So thank you.